very welcome this evening to our Forest Young Professionals Network webinar after the summer break. Uh, my name is Darren Moriarty. I'm a researcher and press officer at the IIA and I also chair the Institute's YPN. We're delighted this evening to be joined by Suzanne Lynch. Suzanne is the Irish Times Washington correspondent. Um, polling day in the United States is less than 50 days away and it has been described as one of the most crucial presidential elections in modern US history. Suzanne, we're going to touch on a lot of different issues tonight, but in our initial remarks, Suzanne is going to offer us her insights on the state of play of the campaign, the main issues that are being discussed, and what either outcome might mean for the future of US politics. An added interesting dimension that we might touch upon later is the fact that um, UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab uh, was visiting Washington only this week, and he held high-level meetings on a range of issues, including, of course, the uh, protection of the Good Friday Agreement. Just in terms of format for this evening, um, I'll shortly hand over to Suzanne, who's going to speak to us for about 20 minutes or so. Then I'll kick off with a couple of questions, and um, then we'll move on to take questions from yourselves, the attendees. If you want to get involved, please send in your questions using Zoom's Q&A function. Uh, you should see that on your screen. And also, if you want to get involved in the conversation on Twitter, you can do that using the handle at IIEA. Before I hand over to Suzanne, let me just give her a brief introduction. Suzanne has been Washington correspondent of the Irish Times since February 2017. She leads the paper's coverage of the White House, Capitol Hill, and US politics more broadly, as evidenced by the fact tonight she's actually speaking to us from Minneapolis. She previously served as Europe correspondent, leading the Irish Times coverage of the Eurozone crisis, Brexit, and the refugee crisis. She began a career in journalism as a financial journalist with RTE and with the Irish Times. She holds a PhD in English from Cambridge University, as well as a BA in English and music. Suzanne, over to you. Thank you very much, Dara, and I'm delighted to be participating in this event today. Um, as you mentioned, I am in Minneapolis. Um, I've just kind of started going out on the campaign trail a bit. Um, we're now less than seven weeks from the election, so it's, it's very good to get out of the Washington bubble um, and actually try to find out what real Americans are, are thinking as we head into this election season. So look, I just thought I'd start um, by just giving an overview of where things stand. Um, I know some people on this call might be avid election watchers and you know, US politics watchers. Others might not be as familiar with, with how it works here. So just a few kind of themes and ideas. And then as you say, we can open it out into, into questions. So look, the first thing to say is um, elections coming up on Tuesday, November the 3rd. And um, at the moment, Joe Biden, the Democratic candidate, is in the lead, according to virtually all polls. Um, Biden was announced, uh, or became really, the Democratic Party's nominee uh, in April. Officially, he was not sworn in, if you like, until the Democratic Convention in August. But in April, the Democratic Party got behind him and he became what they call the presumptive nominee. Um, and this, just to remind people, this followed a very fractious and divisive primary campaign where dozens at one point, or more than a dozen, candidates were vying to become the Democratic nominee, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, Pete Buttigieg, Kamala Harris, etc. Um, so for about a year, we saw this very tightly fought campaign. Um, and Joe Biden did very poorly in the early primaries in Iowa and New Hampshire. They're the first states to, to choose who their candidate is going to be. Um, but he made one of the biggest political comebacks, really, frankly, in election, U.S. election history. Um, he, he scored a decisive win in South Carolina. That's got a big black population. Um, they really backed Biden. He came out on top there and in March, on the 3rd of Mar around the 3rd of March. And the other candidates gradually fell by the YU side. And eventually, they all went in behind Joe Biden. So that's kind of important because Joe Biden has his own battles to fight within the Democratic Party. There's some people in the Democratic Party who feel that he doesn't re represent what they are now, a modern, diverse, increasingly useful party. Here's another older white guy in his late 70s. Um, but anyway, um, they've gone with Biden and he is now facing Donald Trump in November. So the polls are putting uh, Joe Biden ahead. But what we've seen in the last month or so is that his lead has been tightening. Um, now, a brief kind of oversight into the way the US system works. Uh, just because you win the most number of votes does not mean you win the election. Although mostly the people who win the election do win the mo most votes. But there have been times in history where that did not happen. And one of them was 2016, the last election, when Hillary Clinton won more of the popular vote, won more votes than Donald Trump. 
But here we have what's called the electoral college system, whereby each state is giving, given a number of electoral college votes. There are 538 votes altogether. And in order to win the election, you must get 270. So that's the golden number. So each state has a proportion of votes. So what happened is some states have more votes than others. And you've got some of the bigger states like Florida has 29 electoral votes and Pennsylvania. These bigger states are very important. But way, the way it works here is um, there are a certain number of swing states, maybe up to 10 or 11. Um, that are the most important because the reality of American politics is that New York is always going to vote for a Democrat. California is always going to vote for a Democrat. Alabama is always going to vote for a Republican. Donald Trump doesn't need to go to Alabama. He's going to win it. But there are a core group of states in the middle, swing states, also called purple states, that tend to swing either way. And they're the ones that the candidates are focusing on. What happened in 2016 was that in many ways, Donald Trump got very lucky. And he won three states that had voted Democrat, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, and he won them. He won them a very, very small margin, but he won them. And it gave him a strong uh, advantage in the electoral college system, and he won the election. This caught Democrats completely unaware, as people will remember. Famously, Hillary Clinton, I've just been to Wisconsin. Hillary Clinton never visited Wisconsin during the 2016 campaign. They thought they had it in the bag, and then a vote for Trump. So Democrats are approaching this very differently this time around, and they're trying not to take states for granted. So um, Joe Biden, since he's emerged as a Democratic candidate, has kind of consolidated his lead and his support among the party. Uh, so he is ahead in national po polls. And throughout the summer, he was quite well ahead. He was more ahead of Donald Trump than Hillary Clinton had ever been. But as I say, in the last month, this has tightened. And also, crucially, it's in these swing states that's important. Biden is still in the lead in a lot of these swing states, most of them. Um, but his lead is quite small, maybe around 4% now, is the latest figure. So this is within the margin of error. It's still going to be very, very tight. Um, so what we're going to be seeing now in the next seven weeks is the two candidates heading to these states, focusing on the swing vote on those states and trying to win. I'm in Minnesota, Minneapolis, the kind of biggest city in Minnesota. Um, that's quite interesting. Tomorrow, yeah, Friday, both Donald Trump and Joe Biden are coming to Minnesota. Um, so, so it's been a very different campaign, I should say that at the outset, because of coronavirus. Um, Donald Trump, I think, learned a lesson. People might remember earlier in the summer, he had a campaign in Tulsa, in Oklahoma. And people may have seen this at the time, there were rows of empty seats. Now, his campaign manager was basically fired soon after that, and we suspect that was the reason. But also there was probably a sense that, you know, even among his core supporters in Oklahoma, they didn't, this was the height of the coronavirus pandemic. They weren't interested in going to a packed hall. Now, since then, Donald Trump more or less stopped campaigning, but in the last few weeks he started again. So we're seeing kind of bigger rallies, nothing like really of the, of the scale we saw in 2016 or in 2018, but big rallies, um, you know, rallies nonetheless. Joe Biden had been very reluctant to come out publicly. People may have heard Donald Trump has been criticizing him as basement Joe, how he hasn't left his house in Delaware. Bit of truth in that, to be honest. But Joe Biden, as these polls have been tightening, we've seen him come out publicly much more. As I say, he's coming to Minnesota tomorrow. Um, so I think he was facing calls for him to really get out and get out publicly, even though these are in quite limited events with very few members of the public there, quite a controlled, it's very hard for media to get there, get into the Joe Biden events. It's, it's very controlled. Um, so that's where the polls stand. Now, obviously, I'm sure people are saying, yes, polls, look what happened in 2016. We all remember Hillary Clinton was well ahead of the polls, and we all know how that story ends, and she didn't win. So look, there's been a lot of soul searching in this country for the last four years about that, about, and I think there's a whole kind of intellectual debate to be had about how polling um, determines voter, you know, outcomes and participation. So I spoke to lots of supporters who, who, in 2016, you know, assumed Hillary Clinton was going to win. So that's why they didn't bother going out and voting. Whereas I don't think that's going to happen this time. I am. Um, there's, there's, there's an element for Joe Biden that the anti-Trump vote, Trump is such a divisive figure now that Democrats are going to get out and vote for whoever their candidate is, who is now Joe Biden. Um, and they won't, they, they've learned that lesson. And the other thing to say about polling, um, and as I say, they're it's, it's tight at the moment. So at the moment, the real clear politics, that's a very good 
website, a very good resource. They have a kind of a poll of polls. And the latest one I just checked, um, Biden is only ahead about, you know, between five and 6% nationally in that. Um, so the other thing to, to note about polls is that traditionally, things can change, they really can change very, you know, very late in the day. And in 2016, a huge number of people, particularly in swing states, were undecided right up until the last week. And most of them went for Trump. I think it is undoubted that Hillary Clinton was a problematic candidate. I know anecdotally from going around the country over the last few years, you know, I talked to lots of people who did not like, Democrats, who did not like Clinton. I'm thinking one state, Michigan, which is going to be really important in the election. Um, I spoke to a congressman up there and he said to me, look, so in, in November, voters will vote for president, but they'll also have other elections down ballot, as they call it, you know, for the, for the members of Congress, for their own state legis legislature um, and other ones. So he made the point that on election day in 2016, lots of Democrats went out and voted. Uh, but they voted down the ballot and they kept the presidential one blank because they could not bring themselves to vote for Hillary Clinton. So that's the reality and that's, you know, that's debatable and people will have their own views. But I think that was the anti-Clinton vote was one of the reasons you could argue that Trump got in in the, in the last time. So now, of course, that's gone. Biden isn't the most, you know, energetic of candidates. The argument is that he might not energize a lot of younger voters in particular to come out and vote. But as I say, I just think that the Trump, um, this is an election about Donald Trump, really. So as I say, I think the fact that Biden is a kind of an anti-Trump figure, he's kind of the polar opposite of Trump. He kind of presents himself as a big unifier. He's a great way of people with people. He's had a lot of personal tragedy in his own life. He lost his first wife and infant daughter in a car crash, brought up his two sons on his own. And then one of those sons went on to die of brain cancer in his 40s a few years ago. And he's got this great, really genuine empathy with people, which I think everyone would agree, I don't think is Donald Trump's strong point. So, um, so look, big health warning with polls, and that's where it stands, but Democrats are not being complacent because that lead is not huge, and as I say, it's been tightening. What we expect to see, some of the themes that are coming up here and that I think are going to really kind of, you know, accelerate in the next few weeks. So, COVID, coronavirus, this has been the big, you know, surprise story of this year. Um, people would have seen the staggering numbers in the United States and Donald Trump has been widely criticized in how he has uh, handled that. Um, and Joe Biden has been very keen to keep talking about COVID. Uh, being the responsible leader, he's always with his mask. A mask wearing has become so political here to the point that I was talking to a voter in uh, Wisconsin a few days ago, um, a woman and her friend, she was about 60. And I was trying to gauge, it was kind of, sometimes you can tell, I was like, mm, I wonder where she is politically. And then I had my mask on and I realized She's not wearing a mask. And I knew then. So I said, are you a Trump supporter? He said, oh, yes, I am. Yeah. So that was kind of my signal. So that's how political it is here. You know, Donald Trump supporters, a lot of them are against the mask wearing. Democrats are for it. Coronavirus, though, it, it, it's a huge dynamic in this campaign. I think Donald Trump in particular really suffered in the early months. People will remember his comments about ingesting bleach all of that kind of stuff. I mean, that was when Donald Trump was doing very badly in the polls. But I think things have changed slightly. The numbers are coming back down in the United States. Infections are quite high, but Donald Trump has got, there is a grain of truth in what he says. It's be, some of that is because of a lot of testing. I've been tested, there's a lot of testing available now in the United States. And the deaths ratio is not as high. So I think Democrats are worried that there could be, you know, corona fatigue by the time November the 3rd comes along. Um, and I don't know how strong of a suit that's going to be for Joe Biden, but we'll see. Perhaps the numbers might get worse as, uh, as the weather starts changing as we get into winter here. So that's one big theme, but unclear is going to pay out, but generally a negative for Donald Trump. The other issue has been the racial protests uh, and urban unrest we've seen over the summer. Again, a story that really came out of nowhere that was um, the killing of George Floyd. I'm in Minneapolis, the city where that happened, in, and yesterday I went to the site where George Floyd was killed, and it was it was pretty moving. I spoke to some people there. There's kind of a, a makeshift shrine, and it's just this ordinary street corner. Anyway, that was that was that was very interesting. Um, but that has been a huge theme, and the issue of racial uh, inequality in this country that continues to define and be a problem in America. But 
there has been a bit of a backlash to that. Now it's, it's very unclear from the polls how how people are are, are responding. But the, the reality was, as well as the peaceful protests, there was a lot of urban violence and looting. So where I am in Minneapolis, there's buildings all boarded up still from a lot of that. So how that's going to play again in these swing states is going to be very interesting. Donald Trump, people may have seen as well in the last month, really tried to hit home on law and order. His message has been, well, he hasn't even been subtle about this. He said it directly, you will not be safe in Joe Biden's America. Speaking to some people in the Biden campaign, I think they are a bit worried about this issue. That Joe Biden, you know, it's a very tricky one. Joe Biden is wants to talk about racial injustice, and he was himself criticised because back in 1994, there was a very important crime bill that was introduced under Bill Clinton, very tough on crime policy. And that is widely accepted to have led to huge incarceration rates for African-American men. And Joe Biden was one of the architects of that. He was in the Senate at the time. And he, so Joe Biden has been on the back foot when it comes to issues of race. He's been trying to prove that he is, you know, he served as vice president under Barack Obama and, you know, but so he, it's a kind of a tricky subject for him. But polls so far seem to suggest that Donald Trump thinks that this is going to be his winning line, but it's quite unclear. Most people still disapprove, you know, more approve of Joe Biden's handling of this issue of, of racial injustice and, and the connected issue of police reform than they do with Donald Trump. So it's difficult. But then I, again, this, this Republican woman I mentioned, I, was, I went to Kenosha, Wisconsin, where there was another shooting of Jacob Blake, an African-American man. And I was, I've got, I'm writing about it at the weekend, but I, I arrived at this place with a sea of burnt out cars. It was this hellish scene. And I presumed, you know, all these cars that had been vandalized had been brought to this area. And then I realized, no, it's a car, it's a car garage that was set alight. With all these cars. So when I was there, these people came, and one of them were these two women who were saying, Look at this, this is what Democrats want. You know, we can't live, or we can't live in this community. So th those issues are very important in this election. That's number two. Number three is the economy, always important in every election, and particularly in American elections. Although I would say again, I'm a big believer in thinking that this election is different. I think it's all about Donald Trump because he has he's just so divisive that I think, you know, people say it's the economy stupid. I wonder, you know. Do, will, it, will people vote on economic grounds the way they did in prior elections? There's so much else going on. Saying that, this is kind of good news for Donald Trump. Obviously, the coronavirus has been a disaster for the US economy. I mean, the figures are huge. Millions of people are out of work. But the figures are improving. And there were unemployment figures earlier this month that were better than had been expected by the markets. So again, the worry for Democrats is that the economy could be gradually getting better by the time November the 3rd comes around. So. You know, and Demo Republicans traditionally are seen as a party, you know, th that are better on the economy. So, you know, it's never really a strong point for Democrats. So that's one of the other themes to watch. And then finally, the other point I was going to make was that this year, very specifically, there's been a huge, uh, there's a huge interest and anxiety about the issue of the actual election infrastructure and mail-in voting. So um, each state is predicting a sharp increase in postal voting this year because of coronavirus. Um, now, America, I know in Ireland it's different, but in America and most countries, to be quite honest, but that's another debate uh, for another day about Ireland's electoral system. But, um, you know, postal voting is used in a lot of states here, some more than others. So like so much in America, it goes state by state. So some states have a very sophisticated, very established system of postal voting where you can request an absentee ballot, you send it, ballot, you send it in the mail, and it's all very organized. Colorado is one state that has it, uh, Washington state. Others are not, they're a bit behind. And um, earlier in the year, there were lots of primary campaigns, as I mentioned earlier, when people pick the Democratic or the Republican candidate. And there were huge problems. So there was delays to postal voting. Um, New York primary counting went on for weeks. Uh, again, Wisconsin, which I've just come from, Milwaukee, actually was the, the clearest example of this. In April, they had a primary. And instead of 180 polling booths around the city of Milwaukee, they had five open. So you can imagine what happened. Huge queues. It was a disaster. So I spoke to the mayor of Milwaukee, um, who I interviewed for my piece for Saturday. And he was all Bill saying, no, we're very organized now. We've been recruiting polling workers. The coronavirus pandemic is not so bad. Um, the NBA, the, the baseball place is giving their stadium. For, over for a polling booth. So they're saying we're, we're organized. 
But there is a worry about postal voting that um, Donald Trump has already questioned um, the legality and the trustworthiness of the whole system of mail-in voting. And he sowed doubts and divisions about that. And he always did. Back in 2016, he went on Twitter just after the election saying, I actually did win the popular vote. It's just that all these people in California voted twice. So he's always kind of had this issue. It's not a new thing, but he's really hammering this home. It's very, very concerning because what he seems to be setting up is um, distrust about the electoral system here and that if he loses, he would argue that it was flawed and it was um, rigged, to use his words. So I think that's a big theme to, to look out for. And that means that it's very, very likely that there will not be an election result on the night of November the 3rd because particularly of the postal votes, it's going to take time to count those. Um, so this will become a, a, a bigger issue if the election is quite tight. I mean, if, if, if Biden really runs away with it and starts winning states like Florida, you know, and Arizona. So, so there are some states, so Arizona and Texas and Georgia, they're Republican states, they tend to vote Republican. But demo, the demographics have been changing there for the last few years. You've got a lot more Hispanic votes. And... Um, Democrats, now they've been saying this for a long time, but Democrats are hopeful that this could be the year that they flip those states, that they uh, win them over, that people will vote for a Democratic candidate. And there were signs this, people may remember Beto O'Rourke, he was um, the Texas Senate candidate in 2018. He took on Ted Cruz, who was running for the Senate in Texas, and it was a very tight race. Huge energy, I went down and covered his campaign, huge energy around Beto O'Rourke, um, did very well, but you know what, he didn't win. So that would suggest to me that, you know, Texas is not there yet either, because this was a candidate, there's a big anti-Trump feeling in a lot of the, among a lot of women in Texas, maybe in cities like Austin, Dallas and Houston. But, you know, he didn't get there in the end. Same with Georgia, they thought they were going to win the governor's race in 2018, didn't happen. So, you know, let's see. But if something dramatic like that was to happen, and, um, you know, Florida is always, people will remember the, uh, the Bush-Gore race 20 years ago now, where it was ultimately decided by the Supreme Court because it was so tight. You know, Florida is still an extremely tight state. Um, so I think it's one of the most important states, actually, on Election Day. It's very hard to judge how that's going to go. Um, and actually, an interesting kind of theme of this, which I'm hoping to get down there and report on this, is that Biden support among the Hispanic community, which is a huge voting bloc, particularly in the Miami area, in Cuba and Venezuela, he's actually relatively unpopular. A lot of the Hispanic Democratic voters voted for Bernie Sanders in the primary. And um, a lot of, particularly in Florida, because of their own background in Cuba, they're very anti-socialist. So, uh, you know, this, this language that you hear from Donald Trump, you know, Joe Biden is just a radical socialist. Like that's probably going to resonate with a lot of the Hispanic voters in Florida, to be quite honest. So it's it's an interesting state to watch. And um, so look, that's where I stand. I might finish up talking now. Um, but that's kind of snapshot shot at the moment. Oh yeah, the final thing just to say before we open it up is that um, kind of date for your diary, if you like. I think a, a hugely important development in the next few me weeks will be the presidential debates. So there are three presidential debates between Biden and Trump. And one vice presidential, being Mike Pence, the vice president, and Kamala Harris, who is Joe Biden's running mate. They, the first one is on the 29th of September. And traditionally, you know, it's like everything, it's like all of us, you know, a lot of Americans, although I do think it's different in Trump's America, but they, they tend to really focus in the last weeks of the campaign. It's natural. It's like the election in Ireland recently this year. You know, so that's when they, people do tend to focus in on these debates. So there's quite low expectations for Joe Biden who is not seen as a great speaker. But to be honest, I don't know, he could perform quite well. I think all he needs to do is kind of rise above it and play the statesman while Trump kind of insults him and he might do okay. So, um, but I think that's, that, that could be, if it was a disaster for Biden, you know, that could be a big problem. So, um, you know, I think that's one of the, and the debates go right up till the end. I um, can't remember now what the last date is, but it's quite close to the election. Day. So we do expect that to have some kind of impact on voter on voters' reaction. So I leave it at that. I think. Brilliant. Look, Suzanne, thanks very much for that. Um, you know, right from the primaries, right up to the present day, and the couple of debates that are coming up. You know, between the president, between the presidential debates and the VP debate, um, you've really covered an awful lot of ground there. There's already questions flying in. 
I will just kick off myself with a couple um, because I did touch upon at the beginning that we did want to get a bit of your insights on, you know, obviously the campaign is, as you say, it's proving very divisive. It's, 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 it's about Trump. It's a four against them. And um, people over here are watching to see, you know, is there going to be a change? Because we've been used to this sort of demands of the Trump administration over the last couple of years. And will there be a reset? Um, you know, what, what do you think, you know, an outcome that sees Biden in the White House would mean for transatlantic relations, for relations between Ireland. You know, we've always seen a lot of the Trump rhetoric about, you know, onshoring some of the, the, the US companies based in Ireland. You know, do, do, do you think there'd be a change in that if Biden's in the White House or what do you, what do you think? Yeah, no, it's a good point. So if Biden is in the White the, the issue is, so Biden was the vice president under Obama. So people kind of feel they know what they're getting with Joe Biden. But I think that's n not quite true because the world has changed in four years. And so think of some of the things that Trump did follow through on, which a lot of his supporters like. The Iran deal, he pulled out the Iran nuclear deal, the Paris Climate Accord, the Middle East, moving the embassy from um, the US embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which was extremely politically provocative. You know, Joe Biden is not going to, well, maybe I'm right, is not going to move the embassy back to Tel Aviv. There's, there's facts on the ground now on a lot of these things. You know, so that's one example. Now, he has said that he's going to put, bring America back into the Paris Climate Accord. But the Iran deal, like that's already kind of unraveled. The EU tried to keep that going as long as possible. Like it's, they still are. But I mean, you know, I can't see it going back to the JCPOA, that Iran deal, for example. So, um, and also I think the biggest, and this is kind of getting to your point, China, like the, the conflict and the, the trade war essentially that's happening between America and China. Um, I think that is about one of the only policy areas where Democrats are in agreement with Donald Trump on. So, you know, Chuck Schumer, who's the top Senate Democrat, you know, has cheered on Donald Trump saying, well done, Mr. President, for taking on China. He clashes with him on everything else. So I think, and the campaign, the Trump campaign is trying to say, you know, Joe is buddies with China. They're kind of, I don't know how well that's working with supporters. Um, so I think Joe Biden is going to continue that. And on your issue on offshoring and, you know, of companies, uh, about two weeks ago now, Joe Biden gave a speech in Michigan. And I mean, it was very worrying for a country like Ireland. He talked about bringing American jobs home. He talked about introducing tax incentives for US companies that are going to bring back jobs to America. He specifically mentioned pharmaceutical companies, which completely you know, refers to Ireland. Obviously, we've got mm. a huge number of US companies. And he said, who are making products abroad and shipping them back to America? And that is what's happening with the US pharmaceuticals in Ireland. Now, the Irish government will, will want to, you know, they'll say, well, it's actually China they're getting at. And it is true, a lot of the pharmaceuticals are coming from China and India as well. But, you know, obviously Ireland is one of those places. So I don't think those pressures uh, in terms of uh, investments in ta the tax regime are going to go away. Although um, one positive the, for the Irish FDI model is that uh, Biden will probably increase the corporate tax rate here, to, uh, Trump cut it. Uh, so that would maybe you know, be less of an incentive then for US companies to come back and to corporate mm. tax rate as Ireland. But that's why. Then just maybe to move on to the Ireland team. Um, as you mentioned there, Dara, in your introduction, you know, we're, the last few days people have seen this, this last couple of weeks, this has really come to the fore. Dominic Rabb was in Washington this week. So look, this is, this is very interesting. I mean, the US-UK trade deal uh, has been, and, and it is important to emphasize, and I think sometimes on Twitter, everybody gets carried away. You know, the UK is not to me, be dismissed in any shape or form when it comes to its relationship with the US. You know, the special relationship between Washington and London is, is very important. They are a huge, they're a big military power, a big defense ally of the United States, which is obviously something Ireland doesn't have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, their embassy in Washington is huge. You know, they might have 500 people working there. You know, it, it's, it's on a different level than the Irish. So it's not to be underestimated. Um, but there is no doubt that the issue of Brexit has been picked up by senior people on Capitol Hill and they have put their foot down. Richard Neal is the chair of the Ways and Means Committee said there will be no US-UK trade deal if the Good Friday Agreement is undermined. And they hold all the cards. The way it works is that the executive branch, the president's, trade representative does negotiate trade deals. So that's been happening between the US and the UK, but Congress needs to sign off on it. It starts in the committee called the Ways and Means Committee. And what happened was, I think the Brit it's fair to say that Britain was kind of caught, got a shock because after the 2018 midterm elections, 
Democrats won control of the House of Representatives and Richard Neal, who they didn't really know much about, was made the chairman of the committee. And all of a sudden, the Britain, Britain are like, oh no, there's a big Irish, he's the co-chair of the Friends of Ireland Caucus. Richard Neal is very into his Irish heritage. And they're like, oh no, it's the big Irish American who is now in charge of trade. What are we going to do? So they've been trying to lobby him. But you will have seen in the last few days that Richard Neal, who's close to Nancy Pelosi, um, they have both said a trade deal will not happen if they are not happy with how Northern Ireland is being treated in the Brexit negotiation. And that is the, that's what's going to happen. There will be no trade deal without that. So if Joe Biden gets it in November, that's another positive for Ireland. Joe Biden is a very proud Irish American, very into his Irish roots. Also, unlike Trump, he's pro, he was at, Obama and Biden were anti-Brexit. They're internationalists. They're pro-European. So um, it's, it's going to be a win, I suppose, for Ireland if Joe Biden gets in from that point of view. Um, in saying that, you know, as I, as I just made the point, it really doesn't really matter, though, who's in the White House. It's all about Congress because they get sign off. So what's more worrying for Britain is that Nancy Pelosi will most likely be, so there is the congressional elections also on the November 3rd. Democrats are probably going to get back into the majority there. Nancy Pelosi is probably going to be back as Speaker and Richard Neal is probably going to be back as Chair of the Ways and Means. So that's really the big issue for Britain. But no, it's it's very, I think there was a sense that, uh, and this is why it was so damaging what happened to Britain this week. There was a sense that the Brit British officials were telling people like Richard Neal, look, don't worry, there will be no border. It's not going to happen. We're going to strike a deal. But it was the break of trust this week that now meant, now means that Richard Neal and those guys are going to be like, no, until this is done on Brexit and we know exactly what's happening, we are not going any further on the trade deal. So I think when I came here first, um, it, was more, it was 20 years since Good Friday Agreement. And I, you know, this issue, the whole Irish American, Northern Ireland thing was not a big issue. And then when Brexit happened, it's like everybody tuned back in again. Mm -hmm. And um, Ireland and Northern Ireland again became, you know, top of, not top of the agenda, but very high up the agenda. So yeah, it's, and it's, it's serious. I mean, they have the power to block it and I think they will. So that's a bit of a mixed bag then for them in terms of what you're saying about so yes. Biden's rhetoric exactly. on bringing it's the It's not like Joe back. Biden is going to be this, oh, happy clappy, it'll all be fine. I mean, I think particularly on tax and investment, he is singing from the same hymn sheet as a lot of the Republicans. Because a, mm. a lot of the Democrats who deserted Clinton were, were Democrat, working class Democrats who feel like their jobs, which is true in a lot of the ways, did go abroad. Um, and so... Democrats and Joe Biden need to tell those people and connect with those people and say, look, we are going to try and keep American jobs in America and listen to your concerns. So yeah, that, that's, that's going to continue to be a theme. And, and kind of the anti-globalization, not as strong under Trump, but it's still going to exist under Biden if he wins. Brilliant. Look, thanks very much for, for addressing those two issues. I know very topical. They only happened this week in the case of, of, of Dominic Rabb being there. So um, great to get your insights on the US side of things from that. Loads of questions coming in. Um, one, you, you, I mean, you've kind of touched on this a little bit in your in your remarks, um, Suzanne, in terms of you know how the campaign is just completely different because of COVID. Um, there's a question here from Colin Bergen. We know the role that money plays in American politics, um, but what other things are important when it comes to campaigning? Um, and he just asks in terms of the actual mechanics of it. I mean, do you have people going door to door canvassing, drawing yeah. leaflets the same as you do here, or is it is it a bit no, more? Interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, so number one, just to, that's a very good point, question. Um, like money still is very, very important here. I mean, there's rules about what individuals can donate, but it's huge. And actually, again, one of the changes that are worrying for the Trump campaign is that Biden's fundraising has gone through the roof. Since they all coalesced behind him, the fundraising has really gone up. But the Republicans, you're saying about campaigning, there is, there's a bit of door to door, but that's more kind of for, as I say, in November, it's not just the president they're electing. It's like, their representatives in Congress. So that's where you get the more local people going around door to door. So mm -hmm. here um, in Minnesota, there are posters for Trump and Pence, but there are also posters for a random person who's running for Congress or for the state. So that's where you get more door to door. Um, so the, uh, but, but advertising is where money comes in. The, you know, the TV ads and everything are huge. Um, so for example, again, Minnesota where I'm in, Trump wants to win this. He hasn't voted Democrats since 1972. He thinks he could win here. And they announced like a $14 million ad buy on TV just in this state, you know, before election. They're very targeted in, you know, it's local affiliate TV programs and that kind of thing, stations. Um, but I think getting, what I'm trying to actually say though is online advertising is now um, very important and online outreach. 
And um, the, the Trump campaign are very strong on this. They're strong, they're, they're, you know, this happened in 2016. I mean, obviously Donald Trump himself is a maestro when it comes to social media. Um, and um, that trickles down to his campaign. So very targeted ads, particularly on Facebook. I think, I don't have the figures here, but one would be surprised, you know, we all, I think, or a lot of us tend to live in a Twitter bubble. The proportion of Americans on Twitter is quite small. The proportion of Facebook is much bigger, particularly among an older cohort of people. So uh, Facebook ads, and of course, that's got very political and, and there's a lot more talk about regulation um, are going to be very important. And I think the, tr the Republicans are ahead. They're just a bit more sophisticated on that. A good, um, a, a good sign, though, for Biden is that in the last like two months, there's been a real uptick in, in the small individual online contributions, which suggests that he's obviously making money that way, but also there's more of a connection between individual voters and online and Biden. So that's, that's very good for him. Um, but yeah, the problem is, I mean, I remember realizing myself in the early days here going to, a, it was actually with Kamala Harris. And I went to her, she, she and I, she was running for president for the Democratic candidate. And I went to an event with her in South Carolina. And I was really surprised. I didn't think she was that great. She was pretty underwhelming. She didn't seem to connect with people. Then after, and I was talking to people afterwards in the interview, and then I said to myself, afterwards, you know what? It doesn't really matter because most people are not going to ever come near Kamala Harris out of a country of 300 million people. They're going to see her on telly. That's how they're going to see her. And they're going to see her online. So really, so it doesn't, it, the retail politics, you know, it just doesn't because the scale doesn't have the same effect. But um, in terms of coronavirus, it has absolutely changed the campaign, particularly on Biden's side, to the point that like, you know, and Biden's strength is connecting with people. Um, and we'll see it like in the debates, there'll probably be no audience at that debate. So, you know, how do, how do speakers respond when there's no laughs, when there's no applause, all of that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it, it really is different. And it, it, it means that there are, it's going to be less, you know, there are going to be fewer events. Trump will probably do more because he's kind of into talking about coronavirus and he, he'll just go to wherever. But there, there will definitely be fewer events and already, um, like Trump has run into problems because states are banning indoor events. So in Nevada, he had this big row with the, with the governor because the governor said you can't have rallies here. It's in breach of so all that kind of thing. But um, I think ads, TV, yeah. right, Just on, you, mentioned, you mentioned Kamala Harris there. There's a question in just how visible has she been in the campaign since she was announced as as um, VP nomination and then just a, a follow-up question from the same the same person and um, just you mentioned that Biden said he will bring um, America back into the Paris Climate Accord how how uh, prominent has climate change um, been in the campaign you know especially in the context of the fires raging in western states uh, you mentioned Biden's trying to connect with younger voters maybe and get the vote out you know is that an issue that he's, he's active on or is it something that you know is just getting lost Okay, so Kamala Harris on the environment. Yeah, I'll start with Kamala Harris one. Um, yeah, I actually, it's a good question. I, this is very personal, but I think she's been a bit absent, actually. Um, and again, this is the problem for Biden. You know, they're trying to do minimal number of events. So there's a, there's a lot of online, you know, online with Kamala, you know, where they're doing fundraising, but that's not really breaking through. Like the TV don't cover that. So you don't see her. So I, I, I would have to say it's been quite disappointing. I mean, she's a formidable politician. I think she was the right choice. I'm, I'm just saying I kind of, when I saw her in action, was a little bit, but I think she was the right choice for Biden. I really do. I mean, for lots of reasons. Um, most importantly is that he's so, you know, he's so elderly, that's very possible she could end up as president. And, you know, you know, she's going to be able to take on Putin and she's going to be able to run the, you know, people, I think that people know that about her. She's very impressive. Um, and, you know, it, it, she's a woman, um, she's non-white, all those things the Democratic Party needs. Although she is a centrist candidate, she's not the le a, a left wing as a lot of the younger, more progressive members would like. But no, that's a very good question. I think she's been a bit absent. And um, I think that's a problem. And I think it may be because, as I say, the Biden campaign are just starting to ramp it up now, where he's coming to Minnesota tomorrow, she's been in Florida. But, it, it, you know, Trump tends to take a lot of the oxygen, really. You know, it's so dra dramatic every day. Like today, there's another story about a former model accusing himself. It's always something. So it's hard for her to break through. So I would agree that I think she's been a little bit disappointed. There's lots of, you know, fanfare when she's announced. And she's been slipped off the news agenda. That may change. Her debate with Mike Pence 
is on, I think, the 7th of October. That would be a huge focus. She's excellent. But Mike Pence is very good. You know, he'll be able to hold his own too. Um, so uh, that's one to watch, and there will be a lot of focus on her. But yeah, I'd agree. I think she's been a bit absent. That might change. Um, climate change, look. Oh, God, what to say about that? I mean, it is, you know, it, it's not a, I don't think it's a huge issue for voters, unfortunately, in America. You're right, though, it, there's a generation gap. And um, a lot of the younger Democrats, people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, who announced Green New Deal, um, you know, she does really represent a huge part of the Democratic Party. That's an expanding part of the Democratic Party who support climate change. So Joe Biden has been quite vocal on it, actually. Um, but I just feel like, again, getting back to what I said at the beginning, Okay, he may win over more young Democrats in New York or California, but that's not what he needs to win the election. He actually needs to win over people in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan who probably don't really care about climate change. I know that's harsh, but it's true. So I don't know strategically if it's worth them kind of, it might actually, and this is the problem with the Democratic Party. They're, they're trying to be true to their values, but to win the election, they have to win over some undecided centrist people, you know, who would maybe tend to vote Republican, but maybe don't like Trump and they want to vote Democrat. So if, Donald, uh, if Joe Biden starts talking about fracking and not having oil, you know, it's going to put those people off. So it, it's just a very tricky, you know, issue for him. But look, I, I think it's, it's, it's like the rest of the world. I think the, younger, the, the generation gap over this. I think the younger people really are feeding it. And of course, now in saying that this week, it really came to the fore because of the wildfires in California. I was shocked here in the Midwest where I am the other day. I was like, God, this is really weird in the sky. And it was kind of hazy. And then I said to myself, it's not. The, and then I read it. It is. It's the, it's the, I mean, it's over a thousand miles away, but the air has actually been affected now because oh of burning so long in, on the West Coast. But you see, that's the problem. Obviously the people in the West Coast are going to be very exercised by climate change. They're going to vote Democrat anyway. So it, there's not many votes in it. I know that's very cynical. So, but I think, um, I think going forward, it's going to become a big issue for the Democratic Party if they want to keep their younger people, you know, together and cohesive as a party. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, certain, there's a certain sympathy among ordinary voters who say with the opposition, but I don't expect it to be a huge issue. Although, again, interestingly, Florida is a very interesting one because, as I said, it's a hugely important state. They've had a lot of problems with flooding there at the moment, flooding um, and climate change. And actually, what's interesting, not to be so cynical, actually, polls are showing that people in Florida, centrist voters, are beginning to really now take climate change. Even someone like Donald Trump has to kind of say, I understand the issues around climate change in this state. So I think it's just going to be tailored to the state, basically, is, is, is what I'm trying to say, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, so a bit, a bit disheartening, you know, in terms it's, of... Sorry. The it, 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 just on a side note, it, I, I mean, it's shocking the use of energy in this country. Like, just living here, it's absolutely yeah. shocking. I mean, there's no re hardly any recycling. You know, the noise, the trucks, everybody is air, you know, machines on all the time. I lived in Brussels for four years in Europe. It's it's just unbelievable. Different. So it's quite disheartening about America. It's quite behind, I think, when it comes to climate change generally. Yeah. Interesting question here from uh, Joe Doherty. Um, Trump has been a divisive figure, but he's also catalyzed other divisions in the country. Even if Biden wins, uh, do you think American elections are likely to continue to see more obviously pop populist candidates? Um, has Trump sort of tapped into something and let the genie out of the bottle? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think he has, actually. And this is, again, a part of, you know, Biden is almost running as the restoration candidate. It'll be all fine. And, like, there's an element of truth in that. He knows what he's doing. He was in the White House for eight years with Obama. But that is an ideal that I don't think is going to happen. That question was absolutely right. I think the genie is out of the bottle. Trump may lose, or he may not, but if Trump loses, his supporters are not just going to go away. You know, they're still going to be there. And it, what will be interesting is where that energy goes next. So a mm -hmm. whole debate will be what happens to the Republican Party. One thing that I find fascinating, and I've tried to write about before, but it's one of the themes I've picked up here now after nearly four years. The, the D Democratic Party is a much more diverse party. It's much more diffuse. So it's more difficult. They've all kinds of people in the Democratic Party. They've people more on the left. They've centrists, you know, people that are seen as too moderate and too in with big business. Where the Republicans have become more cohesive as a bloc, and they've become more um, motivated by cultural issues. So, like abortion is a huge issue for so many voters in this country, like just the issue. Um, Trump's promise to appoint conservative justices 
of the Supreme Court and a, at federal level, another big issue. So thousands of Republicans held their nose and voted for Donald Trump because of that. So, um, so that Republican Party is going to continue in that vein, and he's made it even more so like that. So people are always asking me, I was down in rural Minnesota yesterday, oh, what about the farmers and the trade war? You know what, like, number one, he's given a lot of bailouts to farmers, but number two is a lot of those voters don't vote on economic rights. It's a bit like Brexit. You don't always vote about economics. I think people forget about Brexit. You know, people, that is not why pe people didn't vote for Brexit because they thought they'd be better off. People voted for Brexit if you like it or not, because they just wanted their independence from Brussels and they want, you know, they want their sovereignty. Wasn't, and it's the same here with Trump. Like farmers here are voting on for different reasons. They're voting for cultural and religious issues like abortion, uh, like law and order, those kind of issues. And I think like that's that, that's not going to go away after Trump. Now there is a more moderate wing in the Republican Party. People like Mitt Romney, people believe it or not, Liz Cheney, Dick Cheney's daughter, who would be you know stereotype Republican. She's actually one of the people who's spoken out a bit about Trump. Um, and then you've got speculation that members of his family might run in the future, Ivanka or Donald Trump Jr. And that is very possible, I think. Um, so he, that person's right. The divisions here are just so intense and it's accentuated and uh, cemented by the division of media, which is a whole other conversation, but it's, it's unbelievable. You know, you either tune into Fox or you tune into CNN or MSNBC and the, the fact that there's no kind of balanced media here, um, I think is a major issue. Mm -hmm. uh, just serving to underline those divisions that will continue. Really, look, there's, there's a good few questions here. I'm trying to uh, take through them. One you've kind of already you've already touched on the mail, the mail-in votes. Um, there's a question here, just more broadly around voter suppression. Um, and you know, you mentioned the big lines in Milwaukee, and you know, there is a targeted nature of this. You know, it is it is aimed at specific voters to try and stop them from coming out. The Republicans yeah. don't want certain voters out. The Democrats are trying their best to get them voters out. Um, can you just speak a little bit about yeah. that? Um, this is a really, yeah, this is a really interesting theme uh, in America, again, which I've learned more about since living here. I mean, people, a lot, most people on the call probably are from Ireland, but you remember learning, well, I do, a long time ago at school about like gerrymandering in the North. Gerrymandering is a massive issue in the United States. It's reached Supreme Court level on numerous occasions. So you've got places like, actually Wisconsin was one of them, uh, North Carolina, where, you know, you, you look at the map and there's little, you know, squiggles where all, you know, the Democrats are shoved into one section. So one, the one problem is that, unlike in other countries, the state, so each state, whoever's in power politically, actually has a lot of authority over drawing the boundaries. So it, it becomes inherently political. Now there are moves to change that and some people are going towards, some states are going towards like an independent electoral commission. But I was pretty shocked that the, it still exists like that. So ironically, when Donald Trump is talking about, oh, you can vote twice, you know, it's all rigged, you can vote twice, people who are dead are still on the register. It, ironically, the exact opposite is the problem, which is people who should be on the register are not on the register and not able to vote. So it's actually mm -hmm. the only problem. So, what happens is, and as I say, like Supreme Court in, at state level and federal level has rolled in on this. There are, a lot of this is racially motivated. And it, it's linked back to the Jim Crow period, to the period after the Civil War and Reconstruction where, where black people were disenfranchised. So for example, in Georgia, very interesting state, a uh, huge history of racial injustice, obviously there in the deep South. Um, I, I report from there in May and Big, a big African-American population. But so things, for example, like, you know, if you arrive to your voting booth and your signature isn't exactly the same or your middle name is on the vote and yours isn't, you won't be allowed to vote. Or, you know, think of that. Or you need, in certain places, you need three forms of ID. And then a lot of poorer people won't have all the ID. They, you know, they mightn't have the driving license or, you know. So there are all these mechanisms that effectively reduce the vote. And they are usually targeted, or the people who suffer from that are usually non-white and poor, or things like restrictions on when you can vote on voting day, um, you know, very tight hours. So people who are poor or working two jobs can't get to vote. So all these kind of things, that happens all over the country. It's particularly prevalent in places like Texas. So for example, this is a slightly different point, but with mail-in voting that's happening, Texas just recently ruled that only people over 65 can vote mail-in. So okay. why? And, and actually most people over 65 are going to vote Republican. So that's going to benefit that, you know. So that's a little example. 
So that is a really good point, and it's a, a big issue here. And um, the Obama, who has stayed out of the public spotlight since uh, since Donald Trump's victory, it's one of the areas that he has kind of got involved with since he stepped down, since since his term came to an end, is this issue of voter participation. And and there's quite a bit of work on that going on. And of course, it's going to benefit. It's going to benefit Democrats. So it's not in Republicans' interest uh, to expand the register anymore. Uh, so and that's the issue about um, Hispanics. So it, you know, very fast-growing population in this country, particularly in places like Texas. Uh, and now, like in the next two elections or so, we're going to have a whole cohort of like teenagers are going to be coming in and. Um, you know, joining the electoral register, but about getting them on the register. It's quite difficult sometimes to register. It's a different system. You have to register. Like when I went for my driving license in Washington, they asked me was I register Democrat or Republican. It's a different system. In certain states, you kind of register. Now you can change. So that allows you to vote in your Democratic primary rather than Republican. So basically, there's a lot more hoops to go through. So in, in essence, it's very complicated. But yes, it's a big problem. And um, linked with the issue of voter vote, Postal voting, I think it could become a big issue in this election. Okay. Fight again. Yeah, something to watch out for. Um, just to change topic slightly, um, question here just on migration. I mean, it was it was one of the big issues that Trump was was sort of uh, campaigning on in 2016. You know, the wall, Mexico, all of that. Is, is, you know, has that been forgotten now, or is it still something that he he bangs on about? I mean, we've seen. I think the Economist uh, was in sort of in the Rust Belt area talking to people, and there was one uh, voter they were talking to who said, "You know, we built the wall. Uh, that's done." Um, yeah. You know, how how is that still yeah, discussed and talked really, about in the campaign? Yeah, really good point. Um, it has kind of gone to the. You know, it, it isn't featuring. Uh, do you know uh, the reason why though? I think is that um, because of COVID, the numbers coming through the borders have plummeted. Okay. Really plummeted. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. have the numbers on to me, but it's had a hugely material impact on it. So as a result, it's kind of not in the, on the agenda. So what's happened during the first term of Donald Trump is that at various points, he has whipped up, you know, fervor about it. So at one point, people might remember, I just came across it recently, before the midterm elections in 2018, two years ago, he talked about this caravan coming up through Central America. And this went on on Fox News, was down with the caravan. This went, you know, it was purely political to rile up, you know, sentiment about it. So um, because there's no migrants really coming in, I think that's why it's off the agenda. Um, it's still a big issue for, uh, for certain voters, I think. Um, but yeah, no, it, unfortunately, it has kind of got off the agenda, I have to say. Uh, okay. But it's changed. I mean, yeah. let's see. Look, with the wall, I mean, there's all this thing about what is the wall. Like, so so there's, there's already bits of fence places. Some of them are more constructed and like it's not an actual wall. And then bits of it, he has built bits of it. But what's happened is he's come into funding difficulty. So the Mexico paying for the wall has not happened, period, period, at all. But what's happened is like he's run into difficulty getting money from Congress and he's been able to tap different sources of money to buy, build bits of the wall and that kind of thing. Um, but look, no, it's not. It just isn't. Um, it's not featuring in the same way as it did at the last time. But maybe that. Right. Right. Um, a couple of other ones here. Um, some of some other questions coming in on you know how divided America is. I don't think we'll go back into that. You've, you've touched on that in detail. One interesting question here is, you know, does the European media just paint Trump as this monster and not really get where Republicans are coming from? You know, you mentioned in your in your analysis yourself. You know, people just pick a couple of things they like about him and then forget the rest. They just say, you know, the economy, Supreme yeah. Court, um, abortion, and they're happy out and they forget everything else. I mean, do, do we not explain that well enough to the European audience? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good point and something I think about a lot. I mean, I'm, you know, a straight reporter, you know, in the Irish Times, we very much differentiate between news and then if I write an opinion. Whereas, you know, I sometimes write an opinion piece, I can say my opinion, but analysis, I try to be kind of just analyze it objectively as I can. And I better be careful how I answer this, but I, to be honest with you, yeah, I think there is two, you know, people, is, there's a simplification about Donald Trump a lot in the media. Oh, look what he's done again. And, you know, the problem is I don't, my own opinion is that I, I, I don't like Donald Trump, but I, and I don't respect him as a leader, but I do respect some of the support, the 60 million people who voted for him. And um, there's a tendency to find, you know, for example, I would probably go to a Trump rally if I 
hopefully won't get coronavirus at it. But anyway, I hope to go to a, Corona, a Trump rally in the next few weeks, which I can go to. I've been to them before. But I mean, I can tell you now what's going to happen to the coronavirus what, at, that, at that rally. You're going to have absolutely diehard Trump supporters, you know, the stereotype with the red hats and everything. You know, that's only a certain slice of the Trump support. It, it's not, so again, the, these two women I interviewed, that, and I could not who the other day, in front of these burnt out cars. I mean, this woman, her name is Anna, she was 60 from Milwaukee, and she was just like a normal person. Like I was thinking, I'm from County Meads. She's like somebody I would meet, you know, my parents' friends that, you know, mm -hmm. absolutely normal, completely rational, former teacher, absolutely fine. And she likes Donald Trump. So you, you're, you're kind of saying, well, why? And so what, they, so what they will all say is, he's talked too much. We wish he wouldn't say tweet. tweet. We wish he wouldn't, wouldn't be so offensive with language, but they're willing to put that aside. And they believe that um, they all say the same thing, which is they like that um, he, he didn't have to do this job. They keep saying this. They, there's a real sense, oh. um, it links back to an earlier question about cynicism about American politics and money and that they're all in somebody's pocket. They like that about Donald Trump, that he had his own money, that he had no agenda except himself and that, you know, he wasn't from part of a dynasty or anything. So people seem to really like that here. And they also feel really that he's followed through on a lot of the things, you know, that he did pull out of the Paris climate change. And so even though half the country is appalled at him and embarrassed by him, you know, another half are not. And they feel that he, he does represent their views. Um, and they do feel that, it's stereo, that they don't all fit the stereotype of the Trump supporter. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I suppose I would. I suppose it's important for us all, you know, to, to try and understand why people voted for Donald Trump. And the, one of the reasons, one of, one of the big um, themes of the early 21st century, I think, has been an awareness of the limitations of globalization. I think we all need to accept that. And I remember being in Davos just after Trump got elected and I was covering it, I was still in Brussels just before I came here. And Christine Lagarde sat, stood on stage at the time she was the head of the IMF and said, there's a problem with globalization. The middle class in America and Britain and the Western countries have not really improved their lot since their parents. And mm -hmm. you know, that's what Trump tapped into. And, you know, people can pretend that, I mean, Ireland is a country that's obviously completely benefited from globalization. But I think the reality is that a lot of Americans feel that they have, and they have been economically left behind. That's a fact. Um, so, but, but again, I'm, I'm probably contradicting myself because I do think that more and more people are voting here on cultural issues, not economic issues. So abortion is just a hugely yeah. uh, issue here. Thanks, Ray. What's an interesting question? And I think, you know, you, you just touched upon all the different issues that I was playing when you tried to answer it. But I mean, it is, it's, it's a very interesting topic. A couple, I do, I do conscious of time, I want to wrap up. There was one question that came in there just said, do you think the Democrats will, will hold the Senate? You're kind of answering your remarks already. So um, another question then, this is probably a bit of a grim uh, question to be finishing up on uh, or coming towards the end of anyway, is, you know, regardless of the outcome in November, do you expect some sort of, civil unrest with the outcome either way. Um, do you think that, you know, the disenchanted, you talked about the racial tensions, if they have to, you know, brace themselves for four years of Trump, um, and then the opposite way, you know, if Trump loses somehow and he cries foul about how it was rigged, I mean, you know, maybe yeah. it's been overblown a little bit, but I mean, do you think there's potential there for, for unrest? I think there probably is potential for unrest, yeah, I do. I, you know, I mean, we're living in a country here where like one theme that didn't come up during the George Floyd protest, I think it's that everybody's so heavily armed here that, you know, it just makes protest much more dangerous. We've seen the instant of protest has been, been shot by, yeah, you know, vigilantes. Yeah. And then, of course, then you've got armed civilian, armed people coming out on the streets protesting. So, you know, it's just, I mean, well, gun crime, actually, if somebody's saying about immigration, gun crime, like I've had to cover mass shootings here, horrific, not featuring in the, in the presidential debate at all. I mean, it's just gone. But anyway, so I suppose I'd have to say yes. I mean, it's, it sounds a bit dramatic to say, you know, this country did have a civil war in, it, in the 1860s, but like it is so divided. Like, that's the problem with Trump. You know, you either are for him against him and, you know, there's no middle ground. People just, he's, you know, that that's, that's very, very worrying. And yeah, I think, I, again, I think what it's going to come down to is the margin of his defeat or victory. Um, and no, I think if Democrats don't win, they'll accept that. I think if Trump's, Trump doesn't win, he won't accept that. So I'd blame it on the, on the Republican side there. But it depends on the win. If it's close, it's going to be very, it's, it's going to be very difficult. 
you could, I mean, Supreme Court had to weigh in 20 years ago on Bush and Gore. I could absolutely see that again. Absolutely. Mm. So, yeah, I suppose. And just to, on that question that I said about the Senate, so I said about the Democrats are probably going to keep control of the House. On the Senate, I think they're going to win some of the seats in the Senate. It's very important, very tight at the moment. Um, Republicans are in the control, but I think Democrats probably will. Um, and what's happening is in certain states, you see, Trump, it depends on your state. Trump is you either, if you're running for Senate as a Republican, if, if Trump is popular in state, you want to be like Trump. But somebody like Susan Collins, she represents Maine and she's a Republican. But a lot of people up in Maine don't really like Trump. So she's trying to kind of distance herself from him. It's very tricky. Um, so it's not one size fits all. It depends where you're running in the country. But I think Democrats would probably, and it'll be a big achievement. So if Democrats to win the Senate and to win the presidency, they're going to control all three, House, the Senate and uh, the White House. And just the last one before we finish up. Um, you know, I mentioned at the very start that you, you, you have been watching the correspondence since, since February 2017, so all you've known is the madness of this Trump administration. Um, what's it been like, well, just, just on a you know, personal level as a journalist out and about covering it, just what's it been like? Um, you know, you mentioned it to some of the other bits you've done in the Europe correspondent and yeah. economics and so on. What's this stint been like? Yeah. Well, in a way, Washington is quite like, for anybody, it's quite like Brussels in the sense that, you know, they're big. In, when I was in Brussels, it was all about, um, as a journalist, we were trying to work out where the, where the centre of power was. Was it the parliament? Was it the council? Was it the commission? And at various times, you know, it was it somewhere else. Uh, so one of those places. It's a bit like that in Washington. Was It's the White House. It's the Congress. It's the State Department. Now, under Trump, it's all the White House. I think that I have had a very White House-centred experience because it's just been so frenetic. Um, but I've been, this sense, people would be shocked when I say this with all the talk about Trump in the media, but I was pleasantly surprised before COVID. I was able to go to the White House press briefings when they still had them, you know, and sit there with everybody else. It was quite open, actually. Um, and maybe this is the First Amendment, I mean, the, you know, enshrined in the Constitution, but I, I've been very happy with the access, actually. And actually being Irish has been a huge advantage because you have the link in with you know, the Irish American congressman in Capitol Hill. I know from other foreign journalists, the British journalists, like they don't really have that. They, you know, they don't have that same connection with some of the, some of the members of Congress. So it's been really good that way. Um, but it is very different as a journalist because I'm reporting on someone else's country, whereas when you were in the EU, you know, Ireland's part of the EU and some of the mm -hmm. stuff happening there is actually affecting us. It's different. Whereas here you're an outsider. Um, but there's a lot of being very disappointed about in America, to be quite honest. And, and one was, it's a climate change stuff. And I'm not, not particularly, you know, not a bit greeny, but that, that's pretty shocking, um, actually, here, I find. Um, the other, of course, is a gun crime, the gun culture, which seems to be just so out of culture with the rest of the world. And, you know. In I mean, on that particular issue, I mean, look, we could, we could be here all night talking about that. But I mean, Public opinion is in favour of some sort of control, so it's just a constant block. But like, what what is that? Yeah. I mean, how frustrated have you been as an outsider watching it? You know, go, yeah, yeah. So, so some obvious. of it, yeah. Some so there, the public opinion is in favour more controls, but public opinion is not for abolishing guns. You know, yeah. so even Hillary Clinton is pro gun or Joe Biden. You know, the Democrats they want more controls, but you know what what's that really? Nobody's ever going to get rid of the right to bear arms here. So I just think it begets more and more violence. I mean, we can see this as an outsider, but I, I have never come across an issue that's so, you know, there's a wall here in America. Very few people really want to engage by changing that fundamentally, which I just think is such an outlier. I mean, or even like the death penalty, it's not an issue that's come up. Trump has taken all the oxygen, so it's not an issue that I've had to cover out here in four years. It actually has not once come up with a, came up once an execution, I think, in Alabama. But, you know, that's been happening and no one's talking about it and no one's covering it. And, you know, you can't join the European Union if you've got step penalty, for example. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world has moved on, you know, and even with gun crime, I mean, Australia had a very similar, is a very similar country in a way and, and they brought in a ban of weapons when they had a big shooting. But it's, it's like, it's just nobody wants to go there here. So I think that's disappointing. Um, so there's a, there's a lot, to be honest with you, I find a little bit disillusioning, but look, it, it's great as well. I mean, Americans, one good thing about being a journalist is that Americans um, love the media and they want to talk to you all the time. And Trump supporters are not, the, the idea of the shy Trump supporter, I think, <laughs> actually, I find they just can't wait to tell you how much they love him and why they love him and how the media is painting him in the wrong light. So in that sense, it's easier than trying to talk to Irish people about um, a political issue if you have to doorstep them on the street. Much easier doing it in America. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, look, I think, you know, a bit of 
a little bit of a positive note to end a bit of a uh, depressing enough section in terms of the campaign and what's being covered and what's not being covered and the priorities and what aren't the priorities. Um, thanks very much, Suzanne, for joining us and sharing our insights. We might maybe get back in touch again once the election's finished and maybe get you in the new year. Tell us you know, whether things have settled down or they haven't. Um, but best luck covering the rest of the campaign. Thanks for putting those days in our diaries about the debates. And uh, we'll be sure to keep reading you. So thanks very much for joining us.